Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I appreciate all the support on last week's video, uh, but we're gonna get back into systems design for the time being. So uh, that means I've got about six more weeks or so of retaining your guys' respect uh, until I actually code for the first time on this channel and everyone realizes that I'm a terrible engineer. So while I have your attention, in the meantime, let's go ahead and talk about Yelp. Yelp is an app that allows you to review local businesses. This way, you can see ratings of various stores in your neighborhood. For example, I run a massage parlor, and it has many five-star reviews. Yelp typically operates on a location basis. When you enter the website, it'll show you places within a certain radius of a point. That being said, it also exposes the ability to perform searches for businesses by their name. Let's formally outline these requirements. This problem is relatively simple in terms of its main objectives. The first one is that we can create an entry for a local business. We just need to provide that business's name, address, and a photo of it. From there, other users should be able to leave reviews for that business. Each review can leave a rating number out of five and a text body expressing how they felt about the service they received. It should also be the case that when a user selects a given business, they should be able to load all of the reviews people have left on it. Finally, we need to be able to search for businesses. The first search functionality is location-based. A user can enter an address and see all the places within a certain number of miles from their location. The second way of searching is text-based. A user enters a search term and sees all relevant businesses on the site. According to some estimates that I see on the internet, Yelp contains listings for tens of millions of local businesses. Just to be conservative, let's have our site support 100 million of them. To actually store the data for a listing, we need to store some location information, a name, a link to a photo, and maybe a bit of metadata. We can conservatively call this one kilobyte of information. That means that our entire table of listings is just 100 gigabytes in size and can comfortably fit on a single server. Additionally, Yelp has reported that they have 30 million monthly active users. If all of those happen to make one query a day on average, that's 30 million queries per day and around 350 per second. Depending on the complexity of the query, it's possible that a particularly beefy single database could handle this throughput. But in the event that it can't, we'll also discuss ways to increase the amount of throughput we can handle. As we mentioned, the entirety of our small business listing database can fit on a single node. Let's map out an initial schema and update it as we go. A first pass at a table schema could be ID, name, latitude, longitude, thumbnail URL. We also need to create a schema for a reviews table. This could be ID, listing ID, poster ID, post creation timestamp, number of stars, and text content. It seems like for our listings table, we want an index on the ID. For our reviews table, it's important that we're able to find reviews by their listing ID quickly. In this case, we likely want an index on the listing ID, and within each listing, an internal sort on the post creation timestamp. In the event that our reviews table gets too large, we can shard it. We just want to ensure that all reviews from each listing stay on the same shard for fast lookups when looking at a given listing. We can use the listing ID as the shard key. Recall that we want to be able to perform searches based on a listing name. A really naive approach here would be to create a secondary index based on those names. The problem with this is that if we want fuzzy text matching or to allow searching for a term that is just one word in the whole name of a listing, we wouldn't gain any efficiency improvements. The proper technique for performing text search is to use a search engine, which is based on an inverted index. An inverted index allows us to map the tokens in the text of each listing back to a listing ID. This way, if a search matches any of those terms, we can quickly figure out all of the relevant listings. We can even go beyond creating an inverted index on just the listing names. Perhaps there are additional descriptors or tags that we can add to the listings, like Mexican food or foot rub from Jordan. Fortunately, this is functionality that certain databases natively support. In Postgres, for example, you can tokenize text columns with a TS vector and then create a GIN, or generalizable inverted index, on top of that. Now you can easily perform text search matching on the data. Oftentimes, developers will choose to use separate systems for their text searching needs. One common example here is Elasticsearch. However, given that we're just using a single node for our system, we can keep things simple and keep it all in a Postgres table. Elasticsearch is built on top of a search engine called Lucene, which I've spoken about more in my concept series. I'll link a video about that in the description. Let's move on to talking about geographic search. How can we figure out all locations that are within a certain distance from a given address? To start, we first need a way of translating an address to a latitude and longitude pair. Fortunately, there are many services that do this for us. 
One example is the Google Maps geocoding API. Once we have our latitude and longitude pair for a user, we need to find the listings near them. The most naive option would be to run a linear scan through our database and manually check whether the latitude and longitude values are close enough in each row. That's silly though, as it's linear to the size of the table. Even though it's not a gigantic table, you don't want to have to read hundreds of gigabytes of data for every one of these queries. What if instead we put an index on our latitude value and then our longitude value within that? You may think that this would allow us to efficiently find all points within a boundary of latitudes and longitudes, but it doesn't really. Consider the fact that when you make an index with two fields, you sort by the first, and then within each value for the first, you sort by the second. For example, if we want to find all locations close to latitude value 100 and longitude value 100, we'll first find all rows with latitude 95 to 105. However, when it comes time to filter down our remaining values, we can't really do this very efficiently. This is because latitudes are a continuous numeric value, and there are going to be very few points that share identical latitudes. Instead, we'll end up basically doing a linear scan over all the points within our latitude range, which is expensive. The common way to solve a problem like this is with something known as geospatial indexing. A geospatial index typically attaches a single value to each row, which is called a geohash. The idea behind the geohash is that all points that are close to one another have very similar hashes. This way, if we want to find all locations near a given point, we just look at the closest geohash values to it. If we index the data by the geohash value, this becomes a very efficient search since geohash values that are next to one another in sorted order are in very similar locations. Under the hood, this can be implemented in many different ways. One common implementation is something known as a quad tree, which recursively divides a 2D plane into four boxes. Each child box has the same geohash as its parent, plus an additional number between 0 and 3. The image on screen represents these in binary. This way, very small boxes that are next to one another have super similar geohashes. This property is retained even when these boxes only encompass a few meters in size. In practice, this isn't something that we want to implement ourselves. Yet again, Postgres has an extension for it known as PostGIS. We can now use geography points in each of our listings and then create a secondary index on them. Now, we can run really fast queries to determine all of the places closest to a given user. Behind the scenes, Postgres chooses an appropriately sized outer bounding box to begin filtering down points to consider, and then checks the exact latitudes and longitudes to see if they're actually within the distance we specified in our query. Note that all points within a bounding box have a geohash that starts with the ID of that outer box. So to find those, we can run a range query from the geohash of the box that we care about until the geohash of the next box. Having an index on these geohash values makes this very efficient. Keep in mind that up to this point, we've basically said that our listings table wouldn't be sharded. That makes life very easy for us, but if we don't partition it, our single node has to bear the entirety of the workload for our application. Besides that, we do need to ensure some fault tolerance if our node goes down. We can run our Postgres database with many read-only replicas. Since we don't really care about data staleness for the listings table, this should be totally okay. Since the amount of new listings being added is fairly small, we should be fine to have our primary node replicating the data to many places at a time. The majority of Yelp users are just going to be lurking and looking at business reviews without actually leaving any of their own. The number of reads on a site like Yelp should largely outnumber the number of writes. Therefore, we want these to be as fast as possible. We can help achieve this, especially for popular searches, with caching. We can cache both our search term results as well as our location-based results. On the location-based results side, every client is in a slightly different position, so in theory we'd probably never get a cache hit. Perhaps what we could do instead is have each client that's in the same zip code search for results from the same starting latitude and longitude. This way, a user in the same zip code would be able to fetch results from the cache if somebody else made a search just before from the same zip code. Like with many of our other caches, we can use an LRU replacement policy here since we don't know what will be useful to cache in advance. We can cache reviews for popular listings also. The first piece of all of this is being able to create a listing from the administrative side of the application. To do so, a user hits an endpoint that processes all relevant information and creates an entry in the listings table. From there, our listings database creates a primary index on the listing ID, a secondary index on a geohash of the listing, and another local secondary inverted index on the relevant search terms. When a user wants to add a review, it gets sent to the database. The reviews table is sharded on the listing ID to quickly fetch all reviews for a given listing. 
If a user wants to see businesses near them or find businesses with search terms, they'll once again hit the listing database or one of its replicas. Ideally though, the result is stored in a cache. To keep things simple, we can use lookaside caching here. If the result is cached, we'll return it back to the user. Otherwise, we fetch the result from the database, place it in the cache, and return back to the user. Ultimately, the design for this video is pretty simple because we get to rely on having a single listings database node. If we couldn't do this, we'd have to worry about sharding out both a geospatial index as well as a search index. These are topics that are worthy of their own videos. For the sake of Yelp, let's consider a different challenge. When showing listing previews either from a location-based search or a term-based search, we want to show an average number of stars that they've received in their reviews. Let's discuss how to do that. To compute a business's score, we can take the average of the scores that it received during its reviews. This is super easy to do by just storing a total number of reviews and total sum of all scores per listing. When showing the average score, we just divide the sum of all review scores by the number of reviews. As we've discussed in many other videos, the naive way to implement this would be to do a transactional write when creating each review. While this may be good enough, it could require a distributed transaction if we have to shard out our reviews table to be on a different node than our listings table. We've discussed in depth why we don't like these. The next option would be to run a nightly batch job on the reviews table to compute the average score of each listing, and then update the listing table with those results. This works too, but can be pretty wasteful from a compute perspective if the majority of listings don't receive new reviews in a given day. Instead, we can use our typical workflow of change data capture. When a review is created, we'll place it in Kafka, and then eventually incorporate it into our listing preview. Given we're talking about Kafka here, there's a possibility that we end up replaying a review and accidentally counting it twice. While this isn't the end of the world, we can protect against it by storing the last seen review creation timestamp in the listing row itself and checking if the incoming review's creation timestamp is larger than that. This works because Kafka should be delivering us the reviews in order of their creation time, though it is notable that this may be buggy in the event that the review creation timestamps are skewed for some reason. Since there aren't that many reviews incoming, this system should save us in the majority of cases. Thank you all for sticking around the video. Hopefully a nice little introduction to how location-based indexing works, as well as a little bit of search indexing as well. Uh, we're going to expand upon this a little bit next week when we talk about Uber.